All right, welcome back. Well, to me, I guess probably no time passed for you, but I took a short break, got another glass of wine. Um, for the record, I recommend a uh, sort of a sweet, fruity white wine, personally, for writing. Um, in any case, so we're going to start charting our main plot points. Um, a lot of this stuff comes from a book called Write Your Novel from the Middle. Uh, might have been James Scott Bell. I don't remember, but if you look at that title on you on uh, Amazon, then you'll find it. Really great book. Um, talks about the importance of the midpoint um, and how to really uh, chart uh, an excellent sort of character-driven story by hinging everything on the midpoint transformation. Um, I can't recommend it enough, but it is a little bit arcane. Uh, it can be a little bit difficult to take that text and understand exactly how to apply it, so that's sort of what this part of the process is about. So, step three, determine your main plot points, starting with the midpoint in this order, the midpoint transformation. Uh, now, we need one of these for both characters, so what we'll end up with is uh, a series of potential scenes. Uh, we may not show each point of transformation for both characters from a, with a point of view scene, a scene from their point of view. Um, instead, we can fold some of them together, for instance, the midpoint transformation. Um, we can do that at the midpoint scene. We can hit both characters at the same time. We'll just show them from different angles, sort of, right? Um, your heroine character, your, your little H character, whether it's a guy or a girl, um, again, I use the same term for both of them, um, generally the receptive character, if you will. Um, they're generally going to be one of the better choices of, of, of point of view for the midpoint. Um, in a straight romance, it's generally going to be a woman. Um, in MM romance, it's generally going to be eh, like the bottom, basically. Um, basically just the receptive character. So the midpoint transformation. We're going to start with Austin because uh, he's the easiest. We already know that he's an uptight kid, right, who... Um, when we get into his backstory, we'll say that he's, um, you know, that he's uptight for some backstory reasons, that he had a lot of pressure from his parents, came from, you know, a really successful family, all those other things. So, um, we want his transformation to show that change, uh, going from, you know, driven by other people to driven by himself. He's going to learn something from, uh, Cable, right? So, for... Now, we said before that he was going to be going to school uh, for engineering. Um, and now that I'm actually looking at this plot point and thinking like, okay, so this is the character change for him that happens at the plot point. Um, you know, it's possible that his parents pushed him to be an engineer, but, I'm, you know, especially since Cable's going to be sort of a criminal element of some sort, um, we might say that instead that he's in law school or something, something that, you know, parents traditionally push their kids to be in. So this is another example of how, like, filling this stuff out starts to inform the rest of the story. We kind of, we will, as we follow this process, we'll actually see a backstory begin to sort of emerge. Um, so we've got our midpoint transformation for him. Uh, midpoint for Cable. Now, he's going to start out, um, let's call it, like, uh, chaotic neutral in Dungeons and Dragons terms. Um, you know, his moral center is is really sort of in himself. He's very self-centered. Um, he has a, not a great deal of regard for rules and law and stuff like that. So we'll say that uh, in the beginning he's sort of living his life sort of come as you may with no real direction. And then at the midpoint transformation, again, he's going to sort of pick this up from Austin. He's going to realize that, uh... Right, so, uh, sort of Romance 101, you know, you want both characters to long for each other and both characters to find something in the other one that sort of completes them or helps them grow into a better person. So the midpoint transformation, these, for... Both of these transformations for Austin and Cable, the whole point of them is that Austin and Cable, they get something from each other, something that changes the other one in, in a significant way, or, or makes them want to change, right? And around the midpoint is at the point at which they're going to figure out what it is that they want that change to really be. Um, 
So we've got Austin, who's going to become a little bit more, you know, not self-centered or selfish, but self-driven, right? And we've got Cable, uh, who is going to sort of become a little bit less selfish. They're going to meet in the middle a little bit. Again, as far as the story goes, the plot events go, what's actually, how this actually plays out, we don't have to worry about that just yet. So now that we know what kind of transformation they're going to have, we know what two extremes we have to demonstrate, right? So for Austin, uh, we want to demonstrate that in the black moment, step number two up here, the black moment and the climax. Now that's perfect because uh, as we remember from the manuscript file, our black moment is an Austin scene and our climax is a cable scene. So that makes it pretty easy for us to show them. And it's sort of perfect too because um, because again, Austin as the receptive character has the most sort of hope to lose. And then Cable, as the sort of hero character, it, it stands the best uh, chance of driving the climax in some way. So uh, for Austin, in his black moment, uh, he's going to... Uh, let's see, how do we want to phrase this? Basically, we want to show the extreme. We want to show that this change in his personality is challenged and that he sticks to his guns, right? Because in, in a romance, we want it to be upbeat. And, and that's true of fantasy and most science fiction, things like that. Like you want, your, you want your main characters to decide on a change that they want to make. They're going to meet some challenges. Sometimes they're going to fail a little bit. But by the time we get to the climax, they're going to succeed. Uh, so Austin, uh, everyone else is making his choices for him. The easy thing is that his parents pay for school. Um, and they tell him that if he decides he doesn't want to, you know, do the legal thing, then they'll pull their funding and he'll have to come up with the money on his own, uh, which he should be able to do because he's a smart and resourceful kid. So that's going to be his black moment. Uh, they don't like the, they don't like cable, they don't like his life change, life choices, things like that. So... And instead of law, something kind of guaranteed to make him grow up poor. Art's a little too easy. Anthropology. Yeah. Now, unspoken in this, because it's sort of a sort of a given for romance. <coughs> the black moment sort of represents the point at which these two characters, you know, kind of lose hope in the relationship itself, right? So up until this point, we know a couple of things already. Looking at it, we know that to get here, Austin had to have changed his degree. So that's going to happen somewhere between the midpoint and the black moment. Um, we know that it's got to also involve a sort of a dark cloud over the relationship between Austin and Cable. Um, so we know that at the black moment, they are presumably broken up for some reason, and we'll figure that out in the course of things. So we already kind of know what the, what the circumstances surrounding the black moment are. Now, the climax is going to be driven by Cable, and we know that Cable, his transformation is that he uh, wants to be less selfish, that he wants to uh, find a specific purpose uh, with his life, um, whatever that process is going to be, in the, in the black moment, that's going to be where Austin and Cable are presumably not going to be together anymore. Presumably they're going to fail in their relationship because that's what the, the black moment is the loss of hope. So, uh, so in the climax, that's going to be getting that hope back. It's going to be driven by Cable, and it means that it has to be driven by his specific transformation. So he has to do kind of a, a selfless act, right, in order to demonstrate that he's made that change. Um, we've got Austin um, switching to anthropology, even though he may not make as much money or be as successful doing it, which nothing against anthropologists. It's just, you know, if you've got your two choices, law school or anthropology, law school offers more money in the short term as a profession. Right with anthropology, you can run around the world and study and get grants and things like that. Anyways, 
I'm saying no offense to anthropology majors here. Um, let's say, just as a rough placeholder, that Cable acts selflessly in order to help Austin pay for school. We don't know what that is yet, and that's perfectly fine. All we know is that he's going to help resolve the conflict with Austin. It'll probably play out like this. He figures out some way to make money, he, but he'll do it a, a straightforward, sort of legal way. If he's a street artist, maybe he elevates his art in some way, sells a piece, or finagles something, whatever. He comes out of the woodwork to help Austin out of the black moment, right? That's sort of the nature of a romance. The hero character acts heroically, right? Um, so we use that as kind of a placeholder. Right, so we got our black moment and our climax. I added some details there for the climax just to give myself the right kind of direction when it gets there. Um, so step four, our pitch point one, the character is pushed to change but refuses. Now, remember that our pinch point, our first pinch point, is a cable scene. So we still want to plan something for both of them, and we might put Austin's scene before or after, or we could split this scene or whatever. But the thing to know about the pinch point is just that um, the antagonistic forces around these characters that can be either the two of them together, or it can be something external. Um, it's a cable scene. Let's go ahead and put them against one another. Uh, so we need to demonstrate that cable is super selfish. And this is going, to, so the pinch point, read that there. The character is pushed to change, but refuses. So in cable's case, he's gonna be pushed to be more selfless but he's gonna refuse through his actions and do something sort of selfish. So, okay, got our first pitch point. And again, if we look at the details here, we're gonna recognize some other plot stuff that's gonna come up later that's gonna help us form this story. Again, Keeping in mind that we don't have a real story yet. We're just sort of discovering it as we go, and that's what this process is so great for, is that you just pick your basic elements, you start to mix them together, and then the story sort of emerges if you follow the pattern, right? Um, so, we already know that Austin's parents threat, uh, are going to threaten to stop paying for school. That implies that they have the money to pay for school, so we know that he's kind of a rich kid. Um, Austin is going to push Cable to pick a direction in life because he thinks that Cable can be more than he is. So that's the sort of, it sort of speaks to like a class and white privilege, right? Like Austin, we already know about his character that he, he may not be really aware of what it means to be born lower class, to be thrown out of your house, to live on the streets, things like that. Those are not realities to him. So this is going to be a point of contention for the two of them and it makes a perfect pinch point because it focuses on the two main characters. Um, you want all of your main plot points generally to focus on the relationship between your two love interests in a romance. So this works out perfectly. Uh, you know, it'll be an argument between the two of them. It'll also start Austin thinking about the fact that here's this guy who, you know, has basically nothing. He has no direction in life, but he's full of probably passion. All bad boys are full of passion and vigor and. Um, you know, they're enjoying probably the sexual aspect of their, of their relationship, and, um, anyway, so, all of that, let me make a note here, because I just, so this will happen once in a while, Austin, so, these two meet, I'm putting it here because, Ultimately, I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at this stuff for events and that sort of thing. So, these two meet because...
it's a little bit loose. We may have to pick something else, but for right now, basically, we're just going to say that he was an intern and that he's uh, assigned to work a case involving cable. So he could end up being doing law school. He'd be end up probably not social work. His parents don't even want him to be a social worker, unless we want to soften them up a little bit, which is fine. Um, but one way or the other, he's going to get involved with the case. He's going to be assigned to cable. That'll be our first plot point. That'll be where these two people are kind of stuck together and they're committed to the story. So um, we're going to cover that in just a second, but I wanted to make the note. Uh, the pinch point two, the character is challenged, tries the new, tries to be the new person, but suffers and fails for it. So this is different than the first pinch point. The first pinch point is where a person, you know, is, is challenged to change, but they refuse. They don't fail to change. They just outright say they're not going to. Um, and that's to build up that change at the midpoint, right? So at the midpoint, they've made the change, or they, they realize they want to make the change. And the first point at which that's really challenged, either by the other person or by the world around them, uh, the second pinch point, they're going to try to live this change. But because they try and do that, things get worse, right? It costs them something. And it's the argument against transformation, essentially. When they get to that point and they fail, they start, they got to think to themselves, like, well, shit, I wanted to make this change, but now that I've tried to make it, like, things are worse than they were before. Maybe this isn't the right thing to do. And of course, we get that confirmed in the climax of the black moment where having changed, it actually works out for the better. So this is all, this is a way of calculating and, uh, and driving tension intentionally. So to change that, there will be no fisting in this story. Um, so second pinch point, it's an awesome scene, we already know that. Um, we're going to say Cable takes Austin Um, so something else is emerging here. Aust Cable's going to take Austin out on a date of his choosing. Even though Austin is going to be the receptive partner here, he's going to be the bottom. He's <laughs> For me, the bookish character is always the bottom. Um, <clears throat> but because, so throughout the story, when they do go out, Austin's going to pay for it a lot of the time. And Cable is trying to be more selfless, right? So he's going to save up a little money, but he's not going to have a whole lot. He wants to take Austin out on kind of a date. And that date is going to involve doing something a little bit illegal, something to kind of push Austin's, uh, push Austin's change for one thing, but also push his limits a little bit. Um, it can be something salacious, like having sex in public, or it could be something sort of sweet, like, you know, tagging his first city government building or something, right? Um, something that could cause him some serious trouble, but he'll do it anyway. So yeah, let's... Choosing. Choose. All right. So, uh, the second pinch point. It is what it says right there. They're gonna get arrested. Okay, so this is good because of a couple of reasons. For one thing, we know that Austin's whole life is, you know, super strict. We know that he's never been arrested before. So for him, this is going to be fine. It's going to slide right off of him. He's a, you know, rich middle-class white kid. Um, if we really want to drive the tension in this story, we could make Cable a black kid. Um, and, and, and pull in a bit of, uh, class and racial disparity as well. So I'll, I'll make that decision later. Um, it would seem straightforward, like, of course, make him a black guy, but I'll tell you this, that in romance, that's a very specific thing. It, like, interracial romance is a very specific genre, so you're appealing to different readers entirely. And I could conceivably get a lot of flack for making Cable a black kid for the purpose of showing this racial class disparity, specifically because I didn't make him the college student or something like that. So, I mean, if I wanted to play it safe, I could make... Cable the white kid and Austin the black kid, eh. Iteration is just it's a quagmire, and if you do it even a little bit wrong, someone will bite your head off for it. Uh, so for now, it's just a class disparity. This is going to roll right off of Austin. It's going to make him a little bit nervous about this change that he's decided to make. For Cable, though, it's going to be a big deal. 
and this is going to be the point at, between the second ditch point and the third plot point. That's going to be where Austin steps in and kind of saves Cable. And it's going to be because he has this legal background. Maybe he knows some people. Maybe he can make one argument or another. Who knows? We'll figure it out. But one way or another, Cable's going to be in a lot more trouble for this than Austin. What he's not going to do is run off because it's the wrong point in the story for that to happen. Or, hmm, or maybe it's not. I don't know. We'll, we'll come to that. Uh, so, page point one, page point two. We got our first plot point, which we already wrote before. And that's going to be an Austin scene. Perfect, because he gets assigned. He's the one that gets assigned. There we go. It's a little bit more detail than I like to put in there sometimes, but uh, but we know that we need to represent. So at the first plot point, now it's not the inciting incident, and the inciting incident probably that's where these two will first meet, but it'll be in a different context, right? So we're gonna we're gonna throw them together, show up, show one context, put them in this situation. And it's going to be one of those things I can't believe, you know, that I have to be around you again, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's, a, that's an excellent formula. It, it works like a charm every time. Um, so first plot point, Austin gets assigned. Now, the last thing that's up here is the third plot point. There's a good reason for doing this last. And uh, I talk about it in the forum post. Uh, a reminder for those who are not from Dirty Discourse, all of this I posted originally on Dirty Discourse as a as a long forum post. Now it's a long YouTube video. Um, but basically we want to look at everything that's been said here, what needs to be said by the end of the story, uh, what needs to be revealed before the last quarter of the book. So after the third plot point, we can, we can reveal information about... Uh, that, that the reader knows, but that the characters don't necessarily know about one another, but we can't reveal new information to the characters themselves. So, we might not do the third plot point right away, right now. Um, we know a little bit about Austin's background. Uh, you know what? We have to do Cable's background. So, Cable, is that a Cable? Chapter, third plot point, Austin. Okay, so it's from Austin's point of view, but so something about the bad boy subgenre specifically is that at some point the bad boy's got to tell the whole truth about where he came from. The third plot of the point is the great place to do that. And at that point, you know, we got to get to a black moment where there's a shadow over their relationship, right? So... You don't have to go back and fix errors like I do, but I, I'm just I'm sort of anal about my typing. Who knows why? Um, so Austin takes you to his parents, and during a stressful visit, Cable finally tells Austin the whole story about his past. Um, I'm just going to throw that in there. Uh, they're going to do that at the midpoint as well. And for these two, because it's a bad boy thing, they might have sex before that. I'm going to find some good emotional places for that to happen. So for me, in romance, sex has to do something to the story, right? So it's got to be for a reason. It's either to demonstrate a degree of connection between two characters, or it's to seriously mess things up. Um, so there will be more sex than just that one scene, even though it's not up here. It just sometimes takes some time to find it. That right there, spilling the background and telling the truth about himself is going to be a very emotional moment. It deserves a sex scene in, in a romance like this, in an MM romance. All right, so we've got all of that laid out. All of those, that's, that's pretty much all the major plot points. Now, our next step is going to have to do with character arc. Um, this is where we plan... The, the actual process of transformation for each character. Now, we already know what kind of transformation they're going to go through, 
the point of this step is to take that take that transform transformation process unfold it into all these different steps and make sure that it's following an arc that's sort of coherent and cohesive um, so the part that correlates to the midpoint is this one discovery that's roughly the middle of the, the, the process um, so these correlate more or less to the main plot points uh, self-realization that's in the denote the, the denouement this is the point uh, where they're rewarded for actually having made this change right they're happier because of it um, so we've got a couple of different steps to go through this is all not only in the template uh, file below but also if you happen to go to dirty discourse or if you're already there then you read my sort of uh, longer breakdown of each of these processes uh, each of this process so the important thing here is that I'm going to do this for both characters Austin gets one formatting Austin gets one and cable gets one um, I'm just gonna okay uh, so basically we already know what the lack is right Austin lacks freedom. Cable lacks direction. Something makes them realize what that they have this lack and want to fulfill it. So for longing for him, it's going to be that uh, Austin sees how So, easy, right? Austin sees how carefree and ease Cable is with himself and wonders what it would be like to step away from his, from his demanding future. Basically, we're going to show Austin what kind of a person Cable is and how much just more relaxed and easygoing he is. And Austin's going to start to think, like, God, I wish I could be that sort of relaxed about my life, but everything is a fucking nightmare because I have a million responsibilities and, you know, people to please and all this other stuff. Um longing for cable so okay what i'm going to do here is i'm going back and forth and i'm doing that because i want to point and counterpoint each of these things um that's what i mean up here as point counterpoints for the romance of the two characters is that at each point i want to show that they're going through a similar process but on different ends of the spectrum because ultimately that's where they want to meet is in the middle of that spectrum right like it's not good to be super stressed out in type a all the time and, and have nothing but a life full of, you know, deadlines and expectations, but at the same time, like, you gotta have some direction. You can't just be, you can't just, you know, <clears throat> you can't just be a criminal and, you know, live with nothing. Um, Should've got a Mac. Anyways. Uh, so, yeah. His longing, Cable's longing, he's going to see... Now, in the end, Cable, the thing that he's going to stand for is probably going to be Austin, more or less. Like, I don't know. We'll figure it out. But, but basically, the idea is that we see these two things counterpointed in one another. And so this is going to be... Now, the, the, the reason that we do this, in part, is to fill out the story, right? So think about this. There are eight points on this chart. Uh, one of them, the midpoint, that's going to sort of happen both people in one scene, more or less. They're going to sort of discover some of this stuff about each other and, you know, make decisions and changes internally and that sort of thing. So if we take that away, we'll say 17. 17 points here. That's 17 scenes. 16, if we say that the self-realization, that the denouement is going to actually be the... the proposal at the end of the story or something that's just going to be Austin scene but still that's anywhere between depending on how these things line up like anywhere between we'll say 13 to 17 scenes that's a huge chunk of that 31 scenes that we've got given that 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, really, because we know that's going to be, uh, we know that's going to be a thing. So nine of those scenes, let's say we can squeeze 13 out of those combined, uh, right? That's 22 scenes, which leaves us just a handful of scenes for subplots or connective tissue and stuff like that. So, <clears throat> so this process, I'm going to just reiterate again, this is about building structure from the ground up and doing it quickly. Um, I realize it doesn't seem to be going that quick now, but that's because I'm stop just stopping to talk about why I'm making these choices, things like that, and sort of trying to make a good demonstration uh, and explain a little bit, especially to people who aren't members of Dirty Discourse and haven't seen the full layout of, of what all of this stuff means and where it comes from and why I do it this way. Uh, so I'm going to go on like this, uh, do the point counterpoint for each of these things. Um, I'm going to take a short break first because my voice is getting a little tired. Then we're going to fast forward through the rest of this. I'll go over it a little bit after it's done, um, but if you want to skip forward, just look for uh, end of step four or the step four summary in the links below. Zip right through that, and uh, okay, so we see the course of transformation for both of these people, and I think it's pretty all pretty much straightforward. Um, but I want you to take a look at just like how exactly this sort of played out, um, because a lot of this came from the work that we did before, right? I'm just building on what I already know are these main plot points from before, so we know what the first pinch point is, the second pinch point where they get committed, we know what they're driving towards with the black moment, and we know about the third plot point. So in here, in this place, in uh, probably the, the resolve area, or maybe the denial area, somewhere in there is where we're going to have that third plot point discussion, and then the resolve, the adaptation, self-realization, most of that is pretty much uh, third act material, right? So, um, I don't know if you, you were able to see or if you skipped ahead, but basically what I did is I went point for point, one and the other. I did, uh, you know, longing for Austin and then for Cable, then catastrophe for Austin and then for Cable, and discovery from Austin and then for Cable, and so on and so forth, back and forth. And uh, when you do it that way, it just, it makes it easy to see how each point sort of connects and lines up with the other character's point, so that when this book is written, the reader has a sense that both characters are transforming, that both characters are going through struggles and changes and making decisions, and that they're sort of paralleled. And what the reader wants, it, it, what the reader's looking forward to, the whole point of romance is specifically, is to see the, those parallels angled towards each other and eventually intersect and cross. We wanna see how both of their journeys reflect one another that they're experiencing the same process but in different ways, and that ultimately it's that connection, it's that similarity between them, even though they're in very different worlds, that ultimately draws them together. Now, that, that process, like this process of doing the point for point, this, this will hold out, this will serve any type of story. Like this one, at its core, is a bad boy story, right? So we've got a bad boy who 
you know, flaunts authority and gets in fights and doesn't care about the law and has no direction in life and is like the, you know, whatever. All the bad boy stuff, the bad boy story at its core is about the bad boy sort of being redeemed, right? He starts out as kind of a, kind of a, a criminal element, a chaotic element, and because he loves the heroine character so much, because Cable loves Austin so much, um, he decides to give up a little bit of that bad boy persona in order to provide the thing that the other character needs. And they do that out of, out of a growing affection, a growing love, right? So this will work for any other type of romance, though. Um, you figure out, you know, what kind of story you want to tell. And then when you get to this part where you're looking at the character arcs, doing them side by side like this and doing them sort of outside of the, the the chapter and scene plotting process, this will give you a ridiculous amount of story to, to draw from when it comes to charting the scenes and the chapters themselves. And we're gonna we're gonna get around to that and you'll see exactly what I mean. Um, so step five, use the major plot points in the character arc to chart the course of the story. This is what I was talking about before when I said out of those 16 uh, parallel character arc points, we can probably get somewhere between 13 to 17 scenes out of it. Um, that, this, that's what we're going to do next. We've got our plot points sort of laid out. We know where those happen. Um, so I'm going to use kind of a shorthand to uh, assign the character arc points to scenes. Um, so it says here, this process, try to pair them up when you can from one character to the, to the other. In romance, this is specifically for romance, this whole video, they don't have to have the same points, they just have to give you direction for the scene you plan it. So what I mean when I say that is, uh, like before, when we talked about the um, discovery scene, right? This is based on the midpoint transformation because that's the nature of that transformation. It's this discovery that, um, that they have to use two paths. So that's what the midpoint transformation is about. It's about looking back on the first half of the story and realizing that the way that things are going, it's dissatisfying, right? At least in a romance. Um, in, other, in other genres, in thrillers and fantasy and sci-fi, the main character, it's a lot more action-based. There's an antagonistic force. They may realize that they've been too short-sighted, that they haven't worked as well enough at a team, things like that. But it's always looking back on the first half of the book up to the midpoint and realizing that the way things have been, they they can't continue to be that way. Or if they do, we risk losing something, right? Um, so it's, that, it's the point at which they sort of face the stakes. So we already know that our midpoint is going to be, you know, in the middle of the book. It's going to be scene 16. And we can take the discovery point for both of these characters and we can put them in the same chapter. We can work those both into the same scene. And um, it's a little, it's not as tricky as it sounds. Um, I'll, I'll show you that when we get to it. But for right now, what we want to do, so if you're in Scrivener, this is one way to do this. It's a way that I really like because it makes things really easy. I'm going to click this I over here to close down that section. I'm going to split the screen. This is the button that looks at, you know, it says vertical split. That's going to give me two windows. We'll say roughly equal-ish. So in one of them, I'm going to leave step four up so that I can see all the stuff that's in here. And the other one, I'm going to go click on manuscript. I'm going to click on the folder rather than any of the individual scenes or opening it up so that I can see the cork board here. Now, if you if that if you're set to the default setting, you'll get this right, or possibly you'll get this. That's how you switch these three buttons up here. That middle button is the cork board and screener. And that'll give you this layout, all of the different, uh, all of these different scenes laid out on the court board. So we're gonna try to diff find the different places to put these things. Now, some of them are gonna line up with the main plot points, and that's fine if they do. But we're just gonna go one by one and look at them. So Austin's lack is freedom. We're gonna put that here in Austin's first scene. We're gonna do actually, we're gonna do them both. I think. Uh, lacks direction. Well, Cable's not going to realize 
that he lacks direction, really, until he sees some... No, no, you know what? You can do it that way if you want. So one way to do this, for instance, in this particular story, would be to say that uh, we don't do Cable's direction lack. We don't highlight that lack until after the inciting incident when they first meet. Um, because that's the point at which, you know, Cable might have seen... Uh, seen Austin and thought to himself like, you know, gosh, I wonder what it would be like if I had any direction in life. But instead we're just going to demonstrate. Demonstrate both of these. If you have the choice to, to show or tell, show. So we're going to show that Austin doesn't have any freedom and we're going to show that Cable doesn't have any direction. So in the summary, this is going to get some additional notes later on. Um, but what I'm going to do is do a sort of a shorthand um, character arc point one. And that's just to tell me that when it comes to summarizing that scene and planning it, I know that I want to take Cable's character arc point one and work that into the summary. So, uh, Austin's CA point one. In a lot of ways, this whole idea of the, the lack something is amiss or missing in the character's life. That's what this part of the character arc is. It's demonstrative. We show, we show where the character starts. Um, that's disturbance material, right? So the disturbance is, again, that showing something is, something is amiss, something is not, not quite right. These characters have crap going on in their lives. Things aren't exactly how they want it to be. Um, yeah, so... That doesn't warrant any other real explanation. So um, I'm going to zip through this point, and I'll sort of talk a little bit about why I put the points where, they, where I did. Okay, so a lot of these will have turned out to sort of align with the major plot points, but that's perfectly fine. That just means that we've got some room for subplots and things like that, and I'll get to those in a second. Uh, but see, I basically just laid out uh, a shorthand connection, and then, like, again, I haven't even really gotten into plotting the actual story yet. This is just setting up the framework, which makes plotting the story really fast. Um, so the disturbance scene, like I said before, uh, character arc point one for both of them and their disturbance scenes. Um, a lot of these are going to line up right next to each other. The inciting incident for Austin, uh, character arc point two. So that means that during that inciting incident, that point where they, that's going to be the fir first meeting between the two of these guys, right? Um, probably. It might end, they might meet at the end of scene three. Scene four will be their first sort of like, the whole scene is sort of dedicated to their meeting, right? Um, so Austin, at that point, that's when he's first going to start to long for this freedom, right? Uh, he Something that makes them realize they have this lack and want to fulfill it. So keep that in mind, in a character arc, people don't know what they want or don't want or have or don't have. People are remarkably unself-aware. Part of the character arc process in, in any fiction not just in romance, but this actually, this actually is, this is for all fiction across the genre. Character arc is in part about self-realization, not necessarily full self-realization. These kids, you know, you know, Austin is probably 20 or 21. We'll say uh, Cable is like maybe 23, he's a year, maybe two years older, 23, 24. So these people are, are still really young. This process of self-realization doesn't make them fully realized individuals who are completely individuated. It's just about identifying at least one thing that they want to change about themselves to be more self-realized. So just when you're planning character arc for just any work of fiction, keep that in mind. Self-realization. Something about them changes because they become aware of themselves. So. 
Uh, change is slow. It takes process. It takes realizing there's something wrong, right? Admitting that there's a problem is the first step to curing addictions or something. Um, so longing is that first step. So that's going to happen early on. For Kate, for Austin, it's going to happen in that inciting incident when they first have their, what they what we would call a meet cute, right? That's when they first meet and it's super cute and they're a little bit attracted but they don't really know anything about each other. Um, afterward, maybe they'll screw around in the inciting incident. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. It would be pretty cool if they did, especially because that would sort of crack Austin's shell a little bit. But afterwards, um, you know, he's going to have learned just a little bit about Austin, and Cable is going to sort of reflect on that, and that's going to be his moment of longing. Is he's going to have a scene. Other stuff will happen there. Keep in mind, this is just folded into it's sort of the theme of that scene, you could say. Um, but he's going to see how driven and focused Austin is, how much he believes or seems to believe in his principles of hard work and service. Basically, Austin is fully committed to being this person that he is at the moment, even though he's super curious about Cable. Um, so that's going to be where he has that moment of longing. Uh, this is the scene, of course, where they start to get uh, forced together, basically. They're going to have to, um, Austin is somehow taking responsibility for Cable. It, in some way that they can't easily extricate themselves from, or they risk they risk giving something significant up, facing serious consequences if they just walk away from the from the table and the thing. So uh, seven, eight, nine, those will be exploratory build up connective tissue scenes. At some point in the early part, I'm gonna establish subplot stuff. Those empty scenes. Uh, seven, eight, nine. Those empty scenes are a good place to fit in some more subplot stuff, especially because it's after the first plot point. We want to we wanna have space to basically say, yes, there's a story going on here, and it's between these two people, but no one is ever involved in just one story. There's other shit going on in your life. That other shit is subplot stuff. There's a strategy to subplots, though, and I'll, I'll talk about that later. Um, scenes 10 and 11, leading into the first pinch point. Austin's scene is catastrophe. Uh, we decided that, let's see, so over the course of these scenes, since that's what we're saying here is in the catastrophe, he's spending more time with Cable. That implies that he's doing it on purpose. So between scene six and scene nine and during scene 10, Austin, there's something, some specific stuff that has to happen. Austin needs to like ditch a class or something like that. We need to show that there's a decline. So there is a montage scene in here somewhere. Six, seven. Oh, I see what I did there. So that'll happen if you click and drag things. Be careful of that. Um, right, so we know that that's happening up through scene 10. That means one of these scenes is probably a montage scene. I think that eight scene... Well, we need space to do a little bit of subplot for both of them. Let's make scene eight the montage scene. We'll do that from Austin's point of view. Well, no, we gotta do it. It's gotta be Cable's point of view. This is a stylistic choice, intentionally going back and forth uh, between one character and the other. Um, it's something that's done really commonly in romance, and it's something a lot of readers are expect and they're really comfortable with. So it's something that really warrants thinking of whenever you start to write a romance novel, if you're gonna do it that way. Um, they're just they're just picky readers. They like things to really they like familiarity, right? Um, so we're going to do the montage scene here. And that's all I'm going to say about that for now. Um, I want you to just notice that there's like this is extremely spare. All of this. It's just structure. There's no super important details and things like that. There's There are details over here. But there's no details in what will become the outline in the end. 
there is a really good reason for that, and it's that all of this has to stay super flexible as you sort of discover and, and the story, and it sort of emerges organically. So this is sort of splitting the difference a little bit at the beginning between pantsing or riding by the seat of your pants and outlining. Um, so we've got cables, uh, character arc, point three, the catastrophe at the pinch point. We already know that the pinch point is going to involve um, something on his end, so what did we decide? We decided that the second pin, or the first pinch point, yeah, Austin pushes Cable to pick a direction in life because he thinks so. Basically, Austin's spending a lot of, these flow into each other really well. Austin's spending a lot of time with uh, Cable. He's starting to realize that his life is slipping a little bit, and because he's feeling that slip, right, he approaches Cable and wants him to sort of not slip as much. Wants he, he's reaching outside of himself. He's uh, projecting, you could say. Basically, my life is slipping just a little out of control, so you need to start fixing your life. And, of course, there's going to be pushback there because Cable doesn't believe in living that way. Um, that's not only good tension, but it's also how people kind of really act a lot of the time. So, again, we've got an empty spot, about four scenes, 12, 13, 14, 15. We look ahead to uh, what's going to happen in the midpoint. There's going to be that change. So after this, we can assume that this pinch point is going to be rough for both of them. They're going to struggle. They're going to argue. Maybe they're going to think that they're going to call it off. We'll do uh, a scene where Austin... You can see we're starting to fill these things in. Uh, we're going to see a scene where Austin basically... Um, Austin misses Cable. This is not the whole summary for the scene. Remember, these are just little notes so that we know where the story is going in terms of character. Uh, cable, naturally, Cable misses Austin. It's going to lead right up into our midpoint where they realize that they're better together than apart. 14 and 15 will be subplot stuff. It'll probably have to do with the fact that they are sort of entangled, right? So this is gonna have, these will have something to do. I don't know what yet because I don't know that whole story. But this will have to these at least one of these scenes will be a subplot scene. Uh, one of them will have to do with Austin and Cable's uh, necessary relationship. So maybe there's a break over a weekend, or there's a week off, or something. For whatever reason, Austin and Cable for two scenes don't have to see each other on a regular basis. And then they do, right? And that leads us into the midpoint. Um, so we know that that's going to be an exploratory character arc chapter for both of them. That's going to be... Whoops. If you, if you click on something, it, it changes the window that you're actually highlighting, right? So the blue means it's highlighted. Character arc four, discovery. This might be better so as a choice. So... Basically, they're going to recognize there are two paths, and that's going to be after they've... So, consider the rhythm here. They... The pinch point challenged them. They fail the challenge. Super important. They have to fail the first pinch point challenge. They split up a little bit, but they miss each other. Whatever else is going on, they're thinking about each other. 14 and 15, somewhere in there they meet again. By 16... They realize that they want this relationship. They may not... Okay, so here's a really important thing, and I said it on the Dirty Discourse Forum. I'll say it here for the YouTubers who may not be on the forum. When you're writing a romance, the midpoint is the best place for the characters to fall in love. It is not the best place for them to tell each other that they're in love with each other and try and make a relationship. Depending on the story. But... In, in this particular writer's opinion, the best place for these characters to admit their feelings is at the end of the book. That's the whole reason that we're reading the romance, right? We're reading the romance to see them fall in love. If they fall in love in the midpoint and they tell each other about it and they move in together, all of the important obstacles between them are, are presumably resolved at that point. Now, not that you can't do it that way and have other obstacles throughout the rest of the book, like the obstacles of living together and stuff like that. Yeah, but it's assumed that two people who fall in love together and move in together and have a sort of momentary happily ever after are probably going to work everything else out. 
if they tell each other that they love each other at the midpoint, then so much of the tension is lost. So my own opinion is to never ever do it. Um, this won't be the first time they have sex. I do often recommend making the midpoint the first sex scene, but with the bad boy, it's a little different. Cable's going to be aggressive, and we want to show that Austin is super uncomfortable with, him, with himself, with his sexuality, that sort of thing. So that's all going to happen back here. Not This will be the first, probably the first time they have full-on, real, penetrative, making love sex, right? Um, so we move on. We've got three empty scenes. Wait, which are already in order. So we have 17, 18, 19 are empty. We'll start resolving some subplot stuff. Really important, we don't have a lot of empty scenes before the third plot point, so we need to start thinking about resolving things at this point. Um, <clears throat> denial, one after the other. Pinch point, that's perfect for him because this is his pinch point at which he, he acts on the change from the midpoint, but it costs him. Right, and he isn't sure that he wants to keep that change up. That's the whole point of the pinch point. You challenge the character. They said they were going to change. They said they wanted a different life. Here's what happens when you want a different life. That's the, the theme of the second pinch point. This is what you have to pay to get that life. So we're going to do that. Uh, Cable's thing will be kind of like almost a bit of a pinch point as well. Um, Austin's change, Cable's change, he attempts to write the straight and error. So remember before, when we were talking about how Cable was going to take uh, Austin out on a date to tag things, it's perfect for that to come after the midpoint because they're both trying to compromise, right? Um, Cable attempts to walk the straight and narrow, his record seems to stand in the way. We, oh, here's something that popped up. His parole officer seems hellbent on proving that he belongs back in jail. You don't always have to have a third, like, antagonistic character. Presumably the two love interests are antagonistic to each other throughout most of the story. Um, but here, a particular character arose, a parole officer, it makes perfect sense. We're going to retcon Cable's story a little bit and say that he did actually have, like, a stint in prison. Maybe, like, maybe like a year, two years, something really small. We'll figure out what you have to do to go to prison for two years in the research phase. Um... But yeah, so he has his denial moment there when uh, he takes he takes Austin out. They go uh, tagging. It's a way of celebrating the second pinch point, making him feel better about the second pinch point, right? So the timing is perfect. But when they get out there and uh, the police catch them, and what happens? Cable bolts because he knows that he'll be sent back to prison. Now, we can justify this internally with Cable however we want to. We can, you know, it doesn't have to be that he's acting selfishly internally, but in a way it's sort of his second pinch point, right? Um, it's the point at which his change is challenged and he he doesn't necessarily rise to it. Um, we, could, we could go either way. That's not necessarily set in stone, and that's part of the reason that this whole process is here. Um, but I like it because I like the idea that that leads us into the later scenes um, the black moment where we kind of give Austin a reason to break up with, with Cable because all of these things begin to pile up. Um, so some of the other things I scattered just because after that we've got another empty scene. This is the point at which we'll probably resolve some subplot for Austin because it's one of his scenes. So once we figure out what his subplots are going to be, that's going to be where one of them resolves. Um, Cable that's his resolve moment, right? So he's run away, something happens here, Austin presumably uh, bitches about it, gets out of jail, something, something, something. Uh, scene 23 is going to be Cable's resolve scene. This is where he feels awful about what happened in scene 21. So he is trying to figure out, like, how can I make it up to Austin? And because uh, remember, his whole transformation is based on the fact that he wants to be something more than he is, and that's because of Austin. So <clears throat> he's offered the chance to get a major heist. Now, this is important. Because we mentioned this here, a major heist by a small group of criminal buddies, um, 
They say it's going to make you tons of money, things like that. We now know we can't just spring that in scene 23. It needs to, we need to allude to it before then. Fortunately, we have several empty scenes where that sort of thing can happen. So we're going to sprinkle clues towards that. And I'm going to make a notation right here. Just like that. Again, doesn't have to be a ton of detail. I'm just going to foreshadow that with, with some of the empty scenes early on. Um, or just anywhere early on. Um, but really, it needs to be developed into a subplot, right? He's got this group of uh, this el uh, criminal element around him. That way, we can show that he's choosing between one life and another. Uh, Austin represents the, the better life that's maybe harder. Uh, but his friends represent the easy life that he's always been a part of. They're not really friends either. They're more like a gang. Um, third plot point. So, after this, uh, he gets his first job doing construction, right? Um, he goes to Austin probably and says something along the lines of, I'm really sorry that that happened. I just want to show you that I'm making a real effort to change here, blah, blah, blah. Austin presumably takes him back because we want the up and down, back and forth in a good romance. Um, the third plot point, remember when we talked about how that's going to be uh, the point at which the bad boy tells the full story? Well, this is great, right? He's just turned his back on that old life and he's suffered for it and he feels this need to really put everything out there for Austin now that he's starting to really commit to this whole thing. Um, so that's going to happen. Uh, Austin, we'll say it ha happens on a break. Find out all the deets on Cable's past. All we're going to say there. So, third plot point, all deets on, on Cable's past. Now, as we move through the, the last quarter of this story, anytime that we come up with something and say, ooh, here's where we learn that something, that's a big red flag. We will go back somewhere into the empty space at the beginning of part of the first two acts of the book, and we'll allude to it. We will we'll tell one character, but not another. We'll tell the reader. We'll make sure that the reader has all the information because these last seven scenes are all just about wrapping things up. They're not about introducing new elements. We've got one, two, three empty scenes, and the rest are all significant in some way. So that's, that's perfect because we can go ahead and resolve some subplots and that sort of thing. Now, so far we've got uh, probably two subplots, which is, and, and they're already got, so they, there are already a couple of places where those things are involved. Um, we'll throw in, we'll so throw some of those into empty scenes. Um, the, the rest of this, I'm not going to go too deep into it. Basically, we know that Austin's got his resolve moment, then Cable and Austin both have adaptation moments. Um, they're going to happen after the black moment, and then the Duno, denouement. That is the uh, self-realization moment. They're going to have it together because it's the happily ever after, right? So in total, how many scenes do we have left to fill up? We've got 27, 25, 22, 19, 17, 18, 14, 15, 7, and 3. I believe that's 10. 1, 2, 3, 4. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 